Williams left open. And he nails it. And Ohio State knocks off number one. The path to greatness isn't always an easy one. For the Michigan State Spartans, each time they step onto the hardwood promises new challenge without the ability to rest on old victory. In order to accomplish goals and achieve greatness, the Spartans must learn from disappointments and rise above. It's Michigan State, it's Rutgers. And you look at Rutgers and you go, wow, they're one and three in the Big Ten. They don't win a lot of games in the conference. But the big issue here today is you got to make sure that if they win another one, it's not here. They'd be a scary team. They do a lot of things very well. They crash the offensive glass. They play very good defense. And so if they are able to affect Michigan State and get their confidence down, because what happened in Columbus was poor shooting, if that continues for Michigan State, we might have another close game here tonight. Cash as Winston will navigate up the floor. Jackson will launch the three and hit. And a slam for Nick Ward. Really good job by Winston. Trying a three again. Ooh. And hits again. Off the dribble. Jackson will try to answer, and he does. Jaron Jackson's second three. He's got nine. Oh, Knights down five. Hanging around just like they did in the yep. first meeting with Michigan State. If you're Rutgers right now, this is exactly where you want the score to be. Tom Izzo's squad in a fight here at home. The bounce down low to Jaron Jackson. Jackson banging his way inside, and the hook shot falls. Jackson, the first into double figures tonight. He's the dump down low to Saw. Candido Saw rejected by Ward. Jackson flipping it to Winston. Winston to the logo, finds Nairn open in the corner. Four three. Offensive foul sends it back the other way. Jackson, 18 on the shot clock, the handoff to Winston, a little hesitation, gets to the rim, bucket, and a foul. Omaruyi finds the basketball to the other end, Omaruyi with a layup, and it's a four point ball game. That's where they move for that ball is in the air. Lot Ward with the emphatic end of the drought. Baker with six to shoot for the tie. We're all knotted up in East Lansing. Langford on the penetration. Oh my goodness! Here he goes to work. Defender fell down and Nairn and Sanders gives Rutgers the lead with 59 seconds to play. Eight seconds to go. Tie game. Rutgers ball. And Sanders two seconds. Sanders one second for the win. No! And we're going to overtime. 18 to shoot. Bridges will pull the trigger on the three and he'll hit right in the eye of Issa John. 14 to shoot for Sanders. Sanders back out to Baker, a bobble. Baker trying to corral it. It goes out of bounds. Last touch by Baker. Overtime. Cassius Winston, the kick in the corner, Langford for three. And Michigan State will survive at home in overtime. The Spartans with a 76-72 win in overtime. What a game tonight at East Lansing. You know, Michigan State got the ball in the hands of their playmakers when they needed it the most. Winston able to salt it away from the foul line. Grew up on the west side of Detroit, uh, six mile Strathmore to be exact. It's my mom, my dad, and me and my two younger brothers, uh, Zach and Kai. We grew up just an extremely close family. You know, we did everything together. That was a big part of my life, you know, just being with them all the time. Cassius has actually always been the same kind of kid. So the kid that you see right now, easygoing, mild-mannered, he's just, he kind of came into the world that way. All fathers dreams about their kids playing basketball. He picked up one of those Fisher Price balls and starts shooting and I'm looking at his form at a very young age and my wife thinking I'm crazy, but I'm saying, look at my man in his form. At one point he dribbled better than he walked. He would just kind of stand there dribbling the ball. So it's been a part of who he is forever. I think we were at like Six Flags, you know the little carnival games where you shoot the basketball. They said that they uh, they handed me a basketball and I started dribbling and people were around me and they started throwing like coins and little dollars and stuff at me while I was dribbling before I could even, like I don't even remember that happening. They tell me that all the time, so 
basketball's been, you know, a part of me since for anything, you know, and it just kind of grew and grew as I got older. I'll tell him to go shoot 500 shots. He'll come back in the house, say, I finished. So I said, go back outside, shoot le left hand 500 shots. He'll go back outside, finish. So anything that I gave him to do, you know, he would, he would, he would take and he embrace it. So it just, it just carried from there. I remember we got our first got our hoop in the backyard. You know, we used to play all the time. They couldn't separate us from the rim back there. You know, we'd play 21 or 101, or we'd, we'd all play on the same team, us against nobody, it's just all types of things in the backyard. And it was just fun, you know, it was just fun, you know, playing that game. And it just, it brought the whole family closer. You know, our dad would work us all out. So every day we'd be in the gym together. And even our mom, you know, who didn't know anything about basketball, she kind of fell into it and started to get into it as we got into it. So it just brought the whole family closer. Cassius's early passion for hoops proved beneficial on the court, but detrimental in the classroom. His mom knew he would need both to be successful in life, so she made a decision that would alter the lives of the entire Winston family. I needed a school that the minimum would be a little higher for him. Um, so UAD kind of offered us that. It offered us the bar a, l a little higher for him, so that worked out really well. Our plan, though, was to only send him to UAD um, for middle school, we have three children, so three children through private school, you know, it's kind of a bit. I was kicking and screaming more than the kids because I'm thinking about, you know, financial, how we're gonna pay and all these things like that. But as we got in there and we, I start seeing how some of the kids, or a lot of kids, how they were as far as um, their behavior, their mannerism, and you know, what, what the interests were, you can tell there's a difference in the, in the climate and the environment. So I'd rather have my son in there. They didn't really discuss to me about going to UD. They kind of, you know, discussed between themselves. And I mean, I'm 11 years old, so whatever decision they make, I'm gonna, to, I'm gonna go with. So, you know, next thing I know, I was at UD, UD Jesuit, my seventh grade year. So the plan was middle school. You'll learn study skills and time management and how to handle, you know, girls and all of that. And then you can go to any high school once you master those type of skills. But what happened to Cash is he turned into a different type of student, a student that was more conscientious, a student that was confident in his academic ability. So um, we went from only going to middle school at UAD to not being able to leave. It was just different from anything that I've experienced, you know, school-wise. Come from public school, it's just a whole different, like a whole different world. And it just helped me elevate myself off the court. You know what I'm saying? I learned how to communicate with people that I haven't had a lot of experience with, you know, different diversities. I learned a lot about people's cultures and stuff like that. And that just helped me just, as a person, you know, to growing into a man, the school wasn't a basketball school. So to get to that point, we just had to work a lot harder, you know? So we just spent a lot of time in the gym, a lot of time, you know, kids just improved. And I think a lot of kids just kind of fed off my work ethic in that school, you know what I'm saying? Just how much time I spent on the court. And it kind of, if it rubbed off on people, you could see the culture changing in the basketball at the school. Cassius quickly became the ultimate dual threat at U of D. Drawing attention from some of the most prestigious programs in college hoops, he helped turn the Cubs into a basketball powerhouse. You know, we're going through the lab line and like Tom Izzo walks in. Who's Tom Izzo here? Why is Tom Izzo, who's Tom Izzo here for? When I first saw Cassius, I instantaneously thought that he was one of the more cerebral basketball players I've ever seen. I think I said it to DJ as a freshman or sophomore that he could be one of the best uh, passers that I, uh, we've ever had. In only his sophomore year of high school, Cassius committed to the green and white, but he was determined to grow as a player in his remaining time at U of D. His drive helped lead the Cubs to their first state championship and landed Cassius Michigan's Mr. Basketball Award for the best player in the state. It's a big, big difference between, you know, dreams and then something that's actually, you know, attainable. You know, it can start off as a dream, but then once you get that little taste or that little feel that you're actually on track to do that, it just, it motivates you so much more. And you know what I'm saying? I dreamed of playing college basketball one day. I dreamed of, you know, going to that next level. And then, you know, people like Tom Izzo and, you know, other coaches start showing up and showing interest. It's like, well, that's actually, you know, I can actually do that. And it just kind of pushes you and makes you work a little bit harder to reach that. It was just a new experience, you know, everything was, all types of emotions going through your head, you know, being away from family, 
didn't have my brothers with me. I guess just how I was raised and the school I went to, it was always something new. It was always something new being thrown at me, always something I had to figure out, an obstacle that I had to figure out. And you know, I didn't look at Michigan State as any different. I kind of came in with, you know, open mind. I wasn't really judging anything, you know, so everything I everything I did, I was just kind of learning on the fly. And you know I mean, I made it out alive, you know what I'm saying? I made it through the year alive, so that was good. As much as U of D prepared Cassius for the next step, the rigors of being a Big Ten college athlete, especially one who must adjust to Coach Izzo's ways, took time to navigate. It was a process, you know, and I think in high school, you're used to being able to do all those things and you kind of monopolize the ball. And I think he struggled defensively some here, which everybody kind of figured he may. He didn't understand the level change. And then and as we started getting into the season, he did. From the beginning of the year to the end of the year, it was just constant growth. I hit some rough patches, you know, just me learning. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, that's just, it happens. It happens sometimes, it happens to the best of us. Just, you know, the game was different. Things didn't were as easy as it was in high school. People were stronger, people were faster. And I just had to learn, you know, what I was capable of, what are things, are things I could and couldn't do. And, you know, Coach Izzo was there. Sometimes, you know, these were supportive. Other times, you know, to bring the best out of me. And, you know, he was there through uh, each and every step. And with each step, Cassius adjusted more and more to Division I hoops. Appearing in 35 games, he helped lead the Spartans to the NCAA tournament. His 182 assists ranking second most of all time by a freshman, trailing only Magic Johnson. Real change for Cassius Winston happened when the season ended, and it was... It was one of those neat things as a coach, and guys were, you know, getting ready to go home. We would give them a, like a month off now to get to get back and get away from basketball. He took three days and came back here and started lifting and working on his body, and and he spent a lot of time on basketball. That kind of told me right then that not only is this kid going to be a heck of a player, but he'll be my starting point guard. After the last season, I kind of just got a chance to just sit back and look at, you know, areas I need to be better at, things I need to do, you know, to change. And then looking towards this season, I had to figure out what I had to be for this team to take us over that hump and make us be successful. And, you know, every day in the summer, I just, I worked with that goal in mind. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want, I don't want to be the reason that this team doesn't reach where, they, where they're capable of going. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be the weak link on the team. So. I worked and I grinded hard in every, you know, weight room and in the gym every day just so that I can hold my end on, you know, what could be a special team. Oh, what a Winston gives it up and Xavier Tillman finishes. The rebound off the miss, the lava hit. All that hard work paid off. Cassius has started every game for the Spartans and has added over 12 points and 7 assists per game while stepping up his defense to the tune of 14 steals on the season. I've been amazed on how far he's come. And maybe because of his high basketball IQ and regular IQ, he figured it out. He's been a great teammate. But I really respect Cassius for figuring out what he wasn't great at and uh, really building on that. And, I think the best is yet to come. It fills my heart with joy um, when any one of my boys puts their mind to something and you see it come to fruition. That's all a parent can ask, is that they, they, they get to live out the thing that they dream, whatever that dream may be. So we are over the moon excited for Cassius. And for us, we feel like this is just the beginning of his journey, that there's anything he puts his mind to, he'll be able to get done. A lot of people can only dream of this, and you know we're living it. We're living it, and a lot of people don't get this opportunity. And you know, every every day we get to lace up, every day we go out there and play, and it is, it's actually just a blessing, you know. It's not just me, it's a lot of people on my journey, it's a little luck, it's all types of things that went into it, into this journey, and got me to this point, and I'm just thankful for it. In the fall of 2015, Michigan State University was given the green light on beginning renovations to the Breslin Student Events Center. The largest part of the renovation would come in the form of a grand entrance, which is now known as the Tom Izzo Hall of History. The Hall of History really developed from uh, many different thoughts that kind of came together at, at the same time. And 
The beauty of the facility is the impact it has on so many different people, not only within athletics, but across the university. Uh, think of entering uh, the Breslin Center now with a, a main entrance. It's a facility that welcomes people, talks about history, um, uh, of basketball, of Michigan State, and that's what I love about it is as you walk through, there's little bits that, that really impact um, almost everybody that, that steps foot on the campus of Michigan State. It actually turned out differently than what it was supposed to be in, in the first place. It, would, it wasn't going to be quite this big, it was going to be more fixed. Uh, displays and so on and uh, as we got into it and as we talked with our architect and our graphics consultants for the space it kind of morphed into something a little different and eventually as to what you see now. What I thought Mark Hollis, Greg and Ani had great vision on is to try to make a hall that is for everyone. In other words, uh, you know, you go to a lot of them and somebody's shoes are hanging there, the jerseys hanging there of the best player. And we still have a couple things left to do up there that we're doing that we're always gonna kind of bring our best players to the top. But this is about all players. It's a hall of history. It's the history of Michigan State basketball. And here, the history of Michigan State basketball is brought to life with over 29 displays and 400 hours of content dating back to the beginning of the sport itself. The Hall of History is something that you cannot experience at any other Division I facility. The biggest challenge was we were trying to do something that's never been done. All the, all the, um, the video and the graphics and lack of fixed uh, display uh, are kind of one of a kind. We, we kind of stepped into some new territories. That's always a challenge, but the fortunate thing is we, we, had, we had a good team, and when we brought people together, we figured out the problems. But I think the biggest challenge was the unknown and the things that we got into as we, uh, you know, as, as we moved through construction and then uh, brought it online. Every day can be different because of the video boards. Every story can be different. Um, those are the things that we really felt was important. It, from day one, Greg Ioni wanted to capture many stories and that's very difficult to do with static displays with displays that are uh, permanent in nature and by adding these video boards by adding the opportunity and the video boards don't look like video boards they they look like part of the design of the facility but they come to life the video on there and the big tv up there and all the coaches that have ever coached here all the big trophies that have ever been won Someday, I just hope to put a big chair in the middle of it and uh, either in retirement or some summer day and just watch every event that's going on because they're going back to the 40s, 30s, I don't know, whenever there was pictures or TV. And I think uh, it's gonna separate us from any that I've seen in the entire country. Welcome to the Breslin Center here in East Lansing, Michigan, Michigan State. Whether they're playing basketball, football, or <laughs> ping pong, throw the records out the window. This is going to be a war. This is a series that dates back to 1909, folks. Michigan State has won five of the last six. Spartans, Wolverines. And here we go from East Lansing. Here's Cassius Winston running the pick and roll all the way to the basket off the window softly and then. How about the progression of this young man, the confidence that he has? Bumping, grinding. Turn around, lefty, hook, short, oh, but Bridges is there for the tip jam. Bridges, he's got a quick first step, drives, hands it off, and a two-hand flush by the freshman, Jackson. Oh, Wagner bumping and grinding, turn around, Jay, block by Jaron Jackson, Jr. Up to a Rockman again, swiped away. Now he wants it on the box, faces, drives hard across, oh, my God. What? Young fella! Simpson, baseline Robinson, catch and shoot, count it. Winston D. The pride of the University of Detroit Jesuit High School. That's something you gotta love about confidence. Bridges, straight away, count it. Winston, the lob! Shilling 
bringing the house down. Defense is starting to really tighten up for both squads. Jackson spinning on the baseline. Oh, he squeezed it through and drew the five. This crowd looking a little nervous now. They didn't expect the Wolverines to be this competitive with a 48-45 lead. Shoot down the lane. Left hand, good. 51-49. Abdul Rahman high off the glass and in, plus the foul. He had seven against Purdue, which snapped a streak of four straight games and what another finish for Michigan State. And here comes a crowd. Baseline, lefty, flick, in and out. And right there for the follow is Langford. On the court, Jackson a three. That time he knocks it down. And Jackson. Bridges on the deck. A tie up and the arrow favors Michigan. The Michigan Wolverines come into East Lansing and record a huge victory over the number four team in America. The final score, 82-72.